What's up, Hack the North? Yo, let me hear. Are you guys having an amazing time? Ah, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so, what are you guys like hacking on? Anything really cool? Like, shout out something you're you're working on that's really awesome. Virtual reality. Virtual reality? Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you're working on virtual reality, like right now in the crowd. Yeah. All right. We got one. Just one. All right. Yeah. Always hacking. Right on. Uh, so we actually have uh, a special guest. He stopped by, got on the red eye just now. Um, we heard he likes maple syrup. We're not really sure who he is, but uh, he's coming down. You might know him, maybe not. Might go on that website. So uh, let's welcome him down. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I have, hi, Waterloo. Oh, I love you guys. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed drinking all of that maple syrup. That was not, that was not just done in post. I actually drank it. You all have, there will be, what, poutine? Oh, but, oh thank you. Yes, one of you lovely hackathoners introduced me to uh, poutine-flavored chips. My life has been changed. I thought, I thought my life changed when I realized your money smelled like maple syrup, but now, now that I know you can eat poutine in chip form whenever you want it, Amazing. America needs to catch up. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy here to be introducing a panel of people whom I just adore. Um, hopefully you all have heard of Y Combinator. Uh, yes. I would hope YC would get a better response than the poutine chips, but <laughs> actually both things can change your life, so let's keep that in perspective. Um, it certainly changed mine. Um, we've got a bunch of really, really smart, really, really accomplished people, so I'm going to get out of their way. And, and, and real quick though, um, I have to award an iPad mini to some very lucky attendee. No, you can't just put your hand up for it, although <laughs> noble effort. I was told the person sitting in seat C is in Charlie 24 has won. Congrat everyone clap it up. Congratulations. Here you go. Oh, that was not. I have been misled. Y'all are supposed to be honest and friendly. All right, everyone, everyone play this game. Are we? How many engineers does it take to figure out who's sitting in Charlie 24? All right, wait. Apparently, there's two Charlie 24s. Oh, that's awkward. Hold on. Judges. The Hack the North team will figure it out. <laughs> All right. Glad, glad we got that out of the way. <laughs> OK. All right. Well, so this panel is going to be super fun. It's called Do Things That Don't Scale. That is obviously from a pretty famous Paul Graham essay. Uh, fun fact about Paul Graham essays. Um, they're all ghostwritten by Jessica. Uh, I'm just kidding. But they could be. Um, do things that don't scale is a really interesting theory um, because it plays out really nicely for startups, right? Because startups who are small actually have huge advantages over large companies. And we're here to talk about what those huge advantages are so you can take advantage of them when you're doing your startup uh, so that you can be in the best position possible for when you apply to Y Combinator. Uh, but just in general, whatever it is you all want to end up doing, know that the people here on this stage have been successful in their own way. The, the tactics they've used have been helpful for their business, but whatever you're going to end up doing is probably going to be some other version based on the overall strategy. So I hope you ask some great questions. Hope you have a lot of fun. Um, this is going to be cool. So without further ado, I'm going to invite uh, the panel come up here. First up, Kasser, our moderator, is the COO of Y Combinator. Kasser, come on up here. Everyone clap it up. <laughs> Hold on, yes, I might run out of questions that way through. <laughs> Am I up? All right, all right. Should I go? Oh, I'm, supposed to, I'm sorry, I was joking around back there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Casser's going to be hosting. Cap it up again for Casser. Uh, yes. All right, man. You ready to do it? Oh, right. Oh, wait. We've yeah, got some hometown everybody. heroes, too. <laughs> Anyone heard of Pebble? <laughs> yeah. All right, Eric. Eric Majakowski, come on out here. Let's clap it up. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to the panel. I welcome you. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go. We're gonna go back to back. I did, uh, I did that was a pretty good reference, right? Our another uh, yeah. another Canadian classic, Michael Litt from Vidyard. Yes. That's pretty good. 
happens, right? There's always two people to say that. Yeah, yeah. This is like the NBA playoffs. <laughs> Number 22 <laughs> from Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now Raymond. Oh, Raymond, I don't know your surname. I'm sorry, Pirelli from T Bot. Right. <laughs> Come on out here. Oh, yeah. All right. Who's coming up? Johnny? Johnny Chin from Bannerman. Come on out here. If you need protection, you call up Johnny, the on demand security service. All right. We got Evan. All right, Evan, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Your socks and shoes game is pretty on point. Oh, okay. Okay. Water, water, water. <laughs> How did you know that trick? Damn, that's No real. idea what that was about. All right. Must be a water loo thing. Anyway, prepare your notes. Get a bunch of knowledge. The Y Combinator panel. Do things that don't scale. Thank you all. Hi guys, uh, my name is Caster. Thanks for uh, having us here today. Uh, I think um, Alexa said a little bit of it, not, but I'll, I'll expand. Um, the panel is based off a Paul Graham essay called uh, Do Things That Don't Scale, and it really talks, um, the essay talks about how big companies are different than small companies. Um, it's a pretty, it's a great essay. If you haven't read it, definitely read it. Uh, what we want to do with the panel today is take some of those ideas and actually talk about specific companies and specific things that these founders did that kind of fit the arc of that, uh, of that essay. Um, so before we begin, how about we do quick introductions or, or, or semi-quick introductions of kind of your company and who you guys are and, and starting at the end. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Evan and I am the co-founder and CTO of Teespring. Uh, what we do is make it possible to create and sell products to, um, to anybody really easily and um, we have many people who use our platform to build their own businesses and so we're tool for entrepreneurs. Um, so yeah, here I am. What class were you? Or what batch were you? Oh, okay, I, I was in winter 2013. So you're not the oldest, but I think, I think Pebble's going to be the oldest. <laughs> hey everyone, Johnny Chin from Bannerman. Uh, we were summer 2012. What we do uh, is we're using technology to disrupt the private security market. Um, what we're uh, able to do now actually is allow someone to push a button on their phone and get a security guard to come to you right away. Um, and that has been something that doesn't exist in the United States. And it's been working really well for different types of businesses. Hey guys, it's great to be back. I'm actually the first class of Mechatronics, class of 08. Any Trons? Um, I then went to do grad school, but then I went to YC in the most recent batch class of uh, Summer 15. <laughs> um, but T-Bot, the company we've created, combines robotics and loose leaf tea. So we, we've created a robot that makes a custom cup of tea in under 30 seconds. Um, we've had locations down in the valley, but we're launching first with Toronto. So oh. come find us there. Cool. Hey, everybody. Uh, Michael Litt, Vidyard, YC, Summer 11, uh, Systems Design Engineering, class of 2011. Two of us. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Vidyard is a video marketing platform, oh, so what that means is we help uh, companies. Uh, the ghost of what do. For both marketing and sales initiatives to optimize both their spend um, and what they create um, by tracking how people view that content and then pushing that data into their marketing automation platforms or CRMs, et cetera. The uh, company was started here in Waterloo um, in a bedroom in a house on Batavia Place uh, next door to Eric Michikovsky's bedroom in that same house on the table place, and uh, he went to YC and, and told me I should definitely apply. We went to the, the class, I think, right after you guys. So. Yeah. Glad to be back. Cool. Right on. My name is Eric Majakowski. I'm the founder of Pebble. Um, I graduated from systems design engineering in 2009, um, started Pebble. Uh, Pebble, <laughs> there's, a few, there's a few people from systems here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I started Pebble because I wanted to be able to see, I wanted to be able to do something pretty simple, which was I wanted to see my text messages while I was bicycling. That was the first reason why I started it. It continued and grew. Um, we, we put out our first, uh, first Kickstarter project back in 2012. We just did another one this year. We, we make smartwatches, um, but in reality what we're working on is something that has a, a little bit of a longer view. Um, 
In the future, we believe people will be wearing technology on their bodies. And it's been becoming increasingly, uh, increasingly evident with fitness trackers and with smart watches and with other smart accessories. So in reality, what we're doing is we're building the, the foundation, the framework, the architecture, the software layer for wearable computing. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, it's going to be a pretty tough battle, but um, we've got a great team, a ton of people from Waterloo, and uh, it's growing. So it's good to be here. Well, uh, coincidentally, Eric and I were actually in the same batch at YC, uh, so I've known Eric from way back when. Uh, I also uh, was, I'm a YC alum, Winner 11, um, and a company called Talkman. It was my second startup B2B company that Google acquired, and I was at Google for a few years, and I joined Y Combinator a couple years ago. Okay, let's jump into the, into the question. So in my first startup, one of the things that we debated as founders all the time when we were kind of in the idea and early kind of product phase was, well, this idea or this product doesn't make sense because you know, it's not very scalable. Like, we, we, we can't do this uh, more than just at one cafe or at one mall or something like that. And a lot of our ideas died. Um, do you guys think that is the right approach? Do you think it's the wrong approach? And, and did you guys go through that with your own companies? So when we created the first T-Bot, <clears throat> just to make a cup of tea faster. My co-founder, Brian, his family owns the Loose Leaf Tea Store. So this was like, how do we make a cup of tea faster for these existing customers? Um, and then we, once we built the first bot, we took it around location to location, like physically he and I, and we found our demographic. So like, we didn't even think about scale in the early days. <laughs> I think one of the interesting things about hardware is that everyone thinks hardware is so hard and it's this impossible behemoth that's completely unlike a software company. In reality, it's not. You can make something today or this weekend that you can turn around and sell to someone. Like People will pay you money in exchange for something cool or something that they want to use. And any, but when you're making that, are you thinking, are there you know, a billion people who can use this? No, and, and you're not thinking about that. And, and what, what you probably have people asking you is, well, how are you going to make 10,000? Or how are you going to make 100,000? And in reality, it doesn't really matter at that point, especially this weekend. Why not? Because you can turn around and sell something. Like, uh, for, that, for that one T-Bot, you, you could have sold that. I, I don't know if you did, but you could have sold that if you yeah. wanted to. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's totally reasonable for people to pay money for alpha products, for beta products these days. We sold the first 30 or 40 Impulse watches, which was our first watch, um, just after hand-making them in E3X. So, you don't have to go to scale right away. You can definitely try to do it in the small scale. Okay, so now I am, let's say, you know, moving forward. So, so I have a one hardware product or I have a, a software idea. How do I actually get those first users? I mean, how, how do you actually sell them? How, uh, I think maybe for hardware it's more obvious, but like if I'm doing B2B software, what do I do? Yeah, I can jump on that one. Um, so we started as a company called Redwoods Media, uh, and we actually made videos for businesses, and that was a gap that we saw in the market. Um, it's no longer a gap. There's a, thousands of companies that do that, and they are largely our customer base. Uh, so what we'd do is we'd sell a project, um, average project size of about $12,000. Um, started doing that during my very last co-op term, and approaching the last year of school, Devin, my co-founder, and I had a, had a plan we called Project Christmas, which was $50,000 in video sales by Christmas Eve 2010. If we hit that goal, we wouldn't go try to find jobs. We could probably sustain ourselves. And as we were making videos for these companies, they kept asking about how to host these videos on the website and how to track the viewers that were watching them and how to attribute ROI to those videos. And so we started working on those technologies. And we soon realized that we could sell videos and sign up these customers for 50 to 100 bucks a month. And over time, we do 100,000, or sorry, 1,000 of these projects. And we start having some recurring revenue that was sustainable. And so our organization was built on sales. We were actually taking orders for that technology before it was even built. Um, and so that definitely didn't scale because a video project takes a really long time. Um, but through that project, you meet a customer, you can learn the requirements, and you build the software around the requirements, which is making something So is, is, for both of you guys that are talking about it, I wonder if, uh, if this is true for the other panelists, do you want to make money that early? Uh, is, I mean, is that a goal? Because you, sometimes you hear, well, you know, just build a product and revenue is not important. And then, but I hear from you guys, well, get the product out there and I sell think, it. I think people pay for your product in two ways. They either invest their time or their money. And so if you've got something that you're not going to monetize right away, um, Wattpad, for example, 
they have no monetization whatsoever, but people spend on average 30, 30 minutes a day on that website. And that's valuable because they're investing their time and how much is 30 minutes worth to you? And so there's kind of two ways to look at it. B2B SaaS, the only metric we're measured against is revenue. So we sell as soon as we have an idea about something that we want to sell. How did, you, how did uh, Bannerman get early users? Yeah, you know, for us, we were worried about building things that people didn't want. So our first milestone was trying to get 10, 10 users on the supply side and 10 users on the demand side. What do you mean by supply side and demand side? Yeah, so what we do is we're a marketplace that connects security guards with individuals and businesses that need security. Um, so while my co-founder was putting together a very simple landing page and uh, you know, just the, the first um, beginnings of just the, the booking platform, I went door to door asking all different types of businesses, you know, is this something interesting? I tried to really get in the mind of the user. How did you find those businesses? Did you like literally walk out of the office and the first business you saw, you went to try <laughs> to sell security to them? Uh, I, I, I mean, I asked everyone. I, I so asked, that's a yes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in San Francisco, yeah. that's actually that's yeah. effective. Yeah. In fact, we were so proud of doing things manually, we came up with our own verb, which is wizard of Ozing. So you, you in fact, you have like this curtain and the user pushes a button, but in fact, it's just me running around and doing things. <laughs> <laughs> and t uh, what do you guys do for Teespring? Um, so uh, I, I kind of wanted to, ba to back up a little bit, if it's cool, and just talk about doing things that don't scale and why that's such an amazing, <laughs> why is it in a, such an awesome phrase? Because it captures the fundamental paradox of what building a startup is all about. I mean, you, when you hear that, you think, how, how is that helpful, build things that don't scale? Like, I'm not gonna be able to reach that big goal of building this company that's, you know, doing millions of dollars in revenue if it doesn't scale. Um, but, but here's the thing, if you do things that do scale, like, things that scale easily are the domain of existing companies, all these large companies. If there's something that scales and it's obvious how it scales and that, that plan makes sense, people are gonna already be doing it. So the magic of actually going out there and creating something new is starting in a place where things don't scale, where you're running around door to door and trying to wizard of Oz it, make everything happen because that's something that a big company would never do. But a startup can do that because you have that flexibility, you have that drive, you have that sort of passion to make it work where you don't need to see, you know, like if you get 10 users in, your, in one week of running around, that's like really big win. For a big company, that's something they would never do. So they'll never discover those new business models that actually only work when you start in a place where it, it doesn't scale. Um, so it's, it is a paradox and then I think I also wanted to comment on your question about whether you should try to make money from the very beginning. Um, so I think this is also a place where you can get into a lot of trouble where uh, maybe you hear do things that don't scale and so you decide, oh, well then that just means I should give this product away for free to everybody. That doesn't scale, but it gets me going. And I actually don't agree with that strategy. I think that you want to see your users um, really take to what you're doing and, and um, pay with either their money or their time from the earliest stages. That's not the part that shouldn't scale. The part that shouldn't scale is how do you fulfill and how do you create that value for the user where you just run around and get scrappy and do whatever the hell it takes to make that happen. But it's good to actually see some kind of uh, proof that the user is willing to pay for your service in one way or another, or else you could scale everything up and then be like, okay, now we want you guys to pay, and then everyone's like, no, okay, I, I'll just leave. I'd rather not pay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So, so you know, I, I'm I'm just uh, my mini team here. Uh, we've come up with an idea, and we've now gone out. What's your what, idea? <laughs> <laughs> I'm making a VR me uh, meeting. Product. I'm just making this up like done, right on the spot. Done, like VR meetings, that's what I want to do. I, I, I want to sell cool. like software that can help uh, people to have, have meetings uh, using virtual reality. I I'm just making this up. So, uh, so we've identified it, we've built a little bit of a prototype. <clears throat> well, like Johnny said, we just literally found local businesses and found a couple of them that have the kind of remote offices in San Francisco. And uh, they've, they've bought in and they're using it. <clears throat> Now for all of you guys, you had 10, 20 users on the B2B side, 100 users on the consumer side. What's the most counterintuitive thing you learned in that early phase, in that first kind of 
three to six months of you got a product and you have some users now, what is something that, you know, present day today or, or you know, old you would not have just guessed that you would have learned about your specific business? I think, I think for me it was the, the sheer volume of interactions required to actually find a user that was willing to pay money for what you were doing. And that's still true for our business today and something that I always highlight. Um, we, on the advice of a guy named Fred Wilson, built a crawler that scanned the DMOZ for every website that had a video embedded on the home page. And that was our, our lead list. And so that generated like 82,000 companies. And then we cross-referenced that data with LinkedIn and Crunchbase information to figure out the size of the business. And I had a list of like 8,000 companies that I needed to call during YC. And I couldn't figure out how to do it in a scalable way. Um, so we just kept ranking those businesses based on the conversations. But, you know, in that, in that time when we sold, you know, the early foundations of our, of our software business, um, I was probably doing 100 conversations a day, 100 to 150, <laughs> um, for four months straight. And, like, I remember, I remember succinctly we had a party at the NYC, and I was on a, a call with a customer um, cleaning puke off the carpet. Like, it's just, that's the type of stuff that doesn't scale. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, actually funny now. story, that, that customer who I was, clean, who I was cleaning up if you could talk to actually ended up becoming my wife later on. Um, and from a, from a, uh, and she's here, thank you, but uh, from, from doing things that don't scale perspective, customer success and marrying your customers definitely doesn't scale. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, so it's just the, the sheer volume of conversations. I mean, 100 conversations might have yielded one individual that was interested in even looking at the software and they probably weren't going to buy. And yep. so every, every week I was trying to find four people, which meant I needed to do roughly 150,000 a day. And it was, it was taxing, it was insane. But we looked at YC as this moment in time where all of our effort amounted to the most important day in our careers, which was demo day. And if we didn't have those customers paying, validating our idea at that time, we were fucked. And so I did everything I possibly could to make that happen. And, That's a technical uh, term. Yes, <laughs> and, uh, and I think it's something that a lot of startups forget about and, and they try to automate those things and that certainly didn't scale, but now we have teams of people that do essentially that. So, you, you know, you can scale through people. T-Bot, you guys are just, you just got out of YC. What's, what's something in the, you know, those first 10 kind of uh, bots that you, that, that you learned that you didn't expect to know uh, when you had zero? Yeah, so I think a lot of what these guys have said is true. The, the smoke and mirrors, the Wizard of Oz curtain, um, and also the ability to like, talk to your customers, learn from them. So we as engineers, I know there's a lot of engineers in the audience, we, you know, we had this idea of we want to make this perfect machine and all these little issues that we saw with the machine, but then we just put it out there. You know, the first one was hideous, it barely worked, but like, the issues that the consumers saw were not what we expected. All those bugs that we expected them to comment on or them to hate were not the ones. They just, you know, they wanted the water a little hotter. You know, I'm like, yeah, I can turn the PID gains. Like, come on. <laughs> so it, it, they'll surprise you. So all those issues that you're, you're working on before you put your product out there, just put it out there and wait for the customer feedback to, to learn what to focus on. We found the best feedback came from actual paying customers uh, <laughs> yeah. compared to, like, we, we gave, we, this is the first product before we did Pebble. We gave it to some people to, to seed it and to get some feedback. Um, we got some good feedback, but the best feedback was from people who, to Mike's point, had invested, in our case, 150 bucks. And they came back every single morning with, you know, here's my, here's my uh, report of the last, last 24 hours with, uh, with the watch. Why do you, know? you think that is? But they wanted to see it succeed. They, wanted the, they, they, they bought into the idea of this new, new device. They wanted to see it get better. Um, and I think they recognized that if they gave us feedback, every week we pushed out new software. And so if they gave us feedback during the week, they would actually see the benefit of that, or they would see the new feature, or they would see a bug fix within seven days. And that's, again, something that I don't think big companies can do. And so that was, it was, it was kind of cool. Like, some of the people that, are give, that gave us feedback four or five years ago are still giving us feedback, but they're still, like, they're bought in. They're, they're really bought in. Jo Johnny, what, what did you see from your first kind of 10 or 15? I did office hours with Johnny around this time, so I know some answers. But uh, Johnny, what, do you, what were the first kind of 10, 15 businesses that are using Bannerman that, that you didn't Yeah, I'd love expect. to dovetail on what Eric was talking about, about um, your early users or customers that really buy in. And I think um, for, for entrepreneurs just getting started, 
it, don't feel bad about pitching the dream, where, where it's going to be, right? Um, for us, it's, our mission is everyone deserves to be safe, and we're making technology make that happen. Um, so don't feel bad about telling potential customers about that as opposed to, oh, we have this one feature that will save you X, Y, and Z. Um, and I think for us, I, I can't speak for everyone on the panel, but it seems with, with Pebble, it, it, I, I believe in what, what, it, what it will become. I mean, I love it now, but I, you know, I, I see a better world with it. And so don't feel bad about asking users um, for feedback, you know, saying, oh, you know, th there's a few things that we're working on to fix. Um, you know, you, you can admit that there's, there's stuff, there's room to grow uh, and collect that feedback from them. Cool. Um, anything in Teespring in the first kind of 100 shirts sold or the first 500 shirts sold that you didn't expect? Uh, I, I mean, not a lot. I think our early use case is pretty similar to what eventually happened. But one thing that was surprising for me was that um, when we launched, we really thought that we were going to see traction with college students, with nonprofits, with these certain types of users that we, heard, we had in our minds about like, oh, these are the people that are going to use our product. And a lot of times when you first launch, I think you're going to be a little bit uh, tunnel vision on things that you have experience with. And like, because I had just graduated from school, I was like thinking like, oh, college students are going to use our product. And it turned out that was like an impossible cohort to sell to. And it actually ended up being like stay at home entrepreneurs that were like our, our biggest first user base. And that wasn't something that we discovered. It was something that our users discovered how to use what, what we had created to, to do that. So um, yeah, I think that it's, it's definitely important to get feedback from your early users. And I totally agree with the point of um, the paying customer is going to be the one who will give you more feedback than the person you give it to for free. Because when you give something to someone for free, all they want to say is thank you. But when someone pays for it, if they have an issue with it, you can damn well bet they'll complain if there's a problem. <laughs> so yeah. OK, so uh, I mean, so I'm building my VR business startup. I, I, I had the company. I got, I got my first 100 users. And I realized that actually my initial view that the San Francisco Teams is not relevant. It's actually you know, uh, companies that are kind of dealing with East Asia or something like that. I have my first kind of 50, 100 users. One, one of the, and I'm, and I'm talking a lot to those users, one of the kind of uh, important themes that PG talks about, and, and generally in early stage startups, is making those first 100 or 200 users incredibly happy. What did you guys do in your businesses um, to kind of fulfill that end? And is, is that something that's kind of you know, important? Uh, it's, it's often said, but is it really important? Is it really relevant? Can you just kind of plow through and get, you know, focus really on going from 100 to 100,000 users rather than making those first 1,000 or 2,000 very, very happy? Uh, can I just keep going? I, if you don't make your first 100 to 1,000 users happy, you are not going to get to 100,000 users. So that is really, I think, the classic thing that doesn't scale that you should do is make your first users really, really happy by doing whatever the hell it takes to, to make them happy. Uh, we have one really good story about this where in the beginning of Teespring, we were, we were running out of money. And we were like, we weren't finding users. We were actually like about to go bankrupt. And the whole thing was going to collapse. And we finally got this amazing shirt order for thousands of shirts because it was a memorial campaign. And these people were rallying around this cause. And it was great. And we printed the shirts. And then a week later, we got a call that we had misprinted those shirts. And this was at a time when we had like not that much money. And in order to reprint those shirts, it was going to cost us like 50% of all the money that we had to our name. And we made the decision to actually do it and reprint all of those shirts because at that moment, there was nothing we could have spent that money on that would have actually made our users happier. So even though it like, put our business in a, a really potentially risky situation, I think it was the right decision to do that because it's so important that you're, you build a good reputation with your early users that you'll go above and beyond and do whatever the hell it takes to make them happy. But how does that, how does that kind of gel with this advice that you, know, you hear people say, you know, move fast and break, or you know, this Facebook motto, move fast and break things. So you know, that, at least that doesn't make sense for me. Am I supposed to move fast and just not, well, uh, not well, care? Or am I supposed to like, spend this diligent amount of time to make every single individual so we, company we, happy? We literally move fast. And the first 20 units or 30 units that we shipped out of our first watch, the backs fell off during the shipping process. Like the, the guts of the watch just spilled out the back. <laughs> wires so the, the things were breaking literally. They were, we literally <laughs> broke things. Not 
purpose. <laughs> um, but probably because we were moving too fast to do things like, like testing, um, though probably, <laughs> probably should have. Um, we, we, the moment that we heard that we did this, you know, we fixed the problem and then shipped 30 units out the next day. Um, so people had two, like okay. every, every one of the first 30 batch had two watches, one that had wires coming out the back. And, and we didn't do the thing where we, we asked them to ship the product back and we fixed it, we just shipped them a new one. Um, I think that, yeah, I, I think you can reconcile the move fast and break things with providing great, a great experience. In fact, it actually kind of reaffirms it when you, when you go out and do it. I think, I think uh, in the B2B SaaS example, a lot of people buy a startup technology and they know they're taking a risk, but they're, they're buying into the innovative thinking that the company's putting in place. And so some, some broken code isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. And the way we delighted our users and made them happy when we started is by having our executive team, aka the founders, talk to these customers because it's very rare that in our case, the demand generation manager at HP ever gets to talk to a CEO. And that's a title that you can use to your advantage and all you really need to do on that call is listen to their feedback and apply that feedback. And, and we have a, a policy inside of our business that we don't actually have any product managers because everybody's a product manager. Everybody talks to users all the time. And users will tell you until they're blue in the face what they want and it's up to you to take that information and infer what they need and that's what makes a successful company. And as we grew, you know, we were able to apply those practices to actual physical ways to delight people. And you know, the one thing I'd say that's really tough to do is a B2B SaaS company is give them an amazing experience, um, amazing unboxing experience. If you're a hardware company, you get your pebble, you pull that zipper on the box. I only know this because I've looked at the unboxing. I haven't received mine yet, but uh, I'm sure it's working <laughs> incredible. Um, so what we do now is we actually send them something really relevant. And a lot of companies try to send a user gift. So you buy our software, we're gonna send you an iPad. An iPad's nice. Households have like eight or nine of them. Um, but it's just not really a relevant gift. And so now what we do is we brokered a deal with, with Canon, so we send a studio in a box, which is a camera, a lens, a mic, a tripod, everything they need, a green screen to set up a studio in their office and everybody needs another camera. And guaranteed, half of those cameras go home and they never even see the office, but it's a relevant experience that can delight the user. So we kind of always think about that and that's how they have the evolution of it, but we still talk to our customers. Um, Devin and I still go to meetings, we take people out to dinner, it doesn't matter how big the customer is, it's still worth our time. T Bot Bannerman, anything you guys did early on that, you know, those first few few thousand users, uh, like Evan said, if you don't make them happy, no, you know, you're not gonna grow beyond that. That was kind of notable or exceptional. Yeah, I think um, in our case, I hand delivered um, handwritten thank you notes, gifts, um, went to many of our customers, um, and that, that meant the world to them because our large competitors who are billion dollar industries don't really care about, you know, this one customer. And so that actually helped when there were instances where the tech failed, right? There are going to be bugs and things happen. And so that did buy us a little bit of leeway early on. Um, but more so, they were able to tell me really um, important feedback that they wouldn't tell someone else. So I thought that was very, very interesting. Um, they, they liked our, our vision. They liked me. And so they, they would be honest about you know, what they really needed. And that helped us build better um, solutions than the traditional providers had. So in our case, um, we focused a lot on consumer feedback. Like my founder and I, we would sit next to the bot, we would you know, engage consumers, we'd sit back and watch them and see where they're struggling, all of these things. But the thing that surprised us was the, the venues themselves. You can't neglect, you, you know, just because you're dealing with the customers, don't forget your other customers, your B2B clients in our case, right? When is the machine gonna be delivered? You know, we have to be there at 5 a.m. to install the machine because they open at 6 a.m. We can't show up at 8 a.m. when they have lines of people and they're watching us put this together, right? So my co-founder has almost completely taken that on himself of just interacting with the, the B2B clients and making sure that they're happy that if any issues come up, you know, some, someone's payment didn't go through, it goes back to them, it looks, back on the, it looks bad on the venue. So he's doing client relations on that side as well, which is not something we, we foresaw. So uh, in my imaginary startup, I'm, I'm making all my businesses happy, but I'm getting feedback which is very diverse and it's taking my company in very, very different directions. So how does that reconcile with make everyone happy, 
and then people are asking for really, really random ass things uh, that our tiny team can't provide. Yeah, everyone so, asks for search, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want wants, search. <laughs> yeah, you're like, well, I don't know how search is going to fit in a VR. <laughs> so how, how, how do you guys reconcile this, this tension of we want to make everybody super, super happy, but some of the requests are absurd and not maybe relevant or kind of outside the scope of what your company does? For me, I think um, YC was great about helping us focus. You know, you, you want to hit your weekly goal. Try to grow 10% week over week with your metric. And so the way to answer that would be, is this feature request going to help me grow 10%? Uh, I think that's really important early on. 100%. Kevin Hale would nail that. Well, we'd come to him with our office hours, and he, we'd be like, oh, well, they have this feature request, and we're working on this piece. Did anybody ask for that? Like, did customers want this? Like, why are you, like, just kept hammering that point home. Like, just focus on your metric. I think that's the best way to filter it out. And for us, it was finding our demographic. We, we took these T-bots to like, you know, Harry Rosen on Bloor, like a high-end men's suit store. We took it to like the suburbs. We took it to a student campus, and we found that students love this product. So now we focus on that demographic. And you know, I have 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds asking me for these, these features that don't matter to the 20-year-olds the that we care about. So we have to filter in the early days, at least, on our core demographic. But aren't those people that so, unhappy when you don't fulfill their request, the 40, 50 year old suburb business? But like, they, they're not the ones using the product, right? We, like when we, when we interact with those people, it's at some big conference or something, and like we were just there for publicity. You know, that's not where we're launching these, it's not our revenue generating machines. But these are still the easy cases. These are when your customers are telling you logical things and you have to decide which logical thing you do. The hardest case, at least for us, was doing things that your customers weren't asking you for. So for example, in the early days, we, we built a watch that worked with BlackBerry. Um, and so we had uh, a ton of users who were on BlackBerry. Which BlackBerry? Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is an easy joke. Not very <laughs> in a wrong audience, wrong audience. Crickets. <laughs> Crickets. Um, and there's two things. So one was, turns out when you go to the Valley, there's a lot of people who use iPhone. And we were building for BlackBerry, and we were saying we're building this business product that showed you email. Um, and we kind of ignored the, the elephant in the room, which was that it didn't work with iPhone. Um, and so while our customers were happy, the people who were using it were happy, the large bulk of people who couldn't use our product, they weren't happy, they didn't even know that they weren't happy. So it was, it was really difficult. And the second thing that we learned in that critical kind of like 500 to 1,000 people flow was developers. So, at the time, we were building a consumer product, something that just, we, we would sell it, and users would use it, and they'd give us feedback, and they'd tell us what they'd want to improve about the product, we'd improve it, and we had that kind of cycle. What we didn't realize is that we were actually sitting on a platform, something that other people could help build greater things on top of. And so, it actually came through a chat with Paul Graham, a 20-minute chat, where he said, Eric, I'm a developer, why can't I build an app that runs on this watch. And I had all these arguments, I had all these you know, excuses. I was like, well, we're building a consumer product. It would be really difficult to let developers build on it. It would be tough. How many developers even want to build on something like this? And we had all these excuses. And then he's like, well, how long would it take to build? And we were like, well, maybe like three weeks. He said, just go and do that. Um, and it was counterintuitive because it wasn't about selling, it wasn't about growing the number of people who, who were buying it. It was totally counterintuitive, but we did it, and we launched it, and we realized this really cool thing, which is consumers, even though we only had maybe 10 or 20 developers that were interested in building apps on top of Pebble that owned, or that owned an impulse watch, the first watch, all of the hundreds of consumers who had one loved that they could download someone else's app or watch face that they wrote for this watch. And so it, it's, it's almost like an activation energy and a chemical reaction that you have to get over this hump in order to then take advantage of it. And for some of these things, they're totally counterintuitive, and you really just have to try some of them. You have to just give it a shot. And some of them are going to fail, and some of them are going to work. But I'm going to go a little off, uh, off topic here, because I think this is an important question, uh, not around do things that don't scale. Um, how do you know what advice you should take? Because that advice, you know, you, you guys are going to, you know, you, all of you here, and then many of you in the audience are going to get a lot of advice. How do you know to take this advice, other than the fact it came from PG, um, and ignore, like, advice that you might get from somebody else? Um, I think that when you think, this is where it's so important to have a very, clear vision of what you are building and that needs to like live inside the the founder's mind of 
this is where we're going. So if you don't have that, that plan in your head of sort of like what you want the company to be in five years and 10 years, it becomes impossible to make these decisions. It becomes impossible to know who to listen to. And uh, when, with, the, with the user feedback, um, you won't know which ones to do and which ones not to do. But if you have a clear vision of where you're going, it's easy to say, does this feature take me towards that eventual vision or not? Can no I matter. play devil's advocate here? Yeah, How, sure. if, uh, if I am, let's say my vision is to build this, this VR you know, uh, a remote uh, business, but then users, are, nobody wants that. H how do you reconcile like having this five-year vision and then the same thing we're talking about is these f first 100, 200 users are telling you something maybe different? I mean, I think at that point you might have to reconsider what your five-year vision is. Like if, if you can't even get your first few hundred users to buy into it, then like I, I, I feel like you, you should be in a, a trajectory where all along the way you're adding value. So a lot of it is like, does every step in this path add more value? Like, and and the, the one that adds the most value is the one you should do first. That's your MVP. Um, but you know, when it, when it comes to complicated VR technology that people aren't using yet, I don't know. That's Anything? And any other really any other thoughts on how to parse advice, good and bad advice? I think I think that's that's a great heuristic. Anything else? I think you need to you need to surround yourself with people whose advice you trust. So going to YC, um, oh, well, I trusted you, yes. you know YC partners' advice. Um, I didn't necessarily trust my my mom's advice on what we should be doing. Right? She's not a buyer. <laughs> and bless her. Um, she just wasn't going to be a paying customer. Um, so I think there's, uh, I don't think she knows what we do, to be honest, but I, I think there's, you know, very, very clear positions on advice. And, and to the point on focus, like you, you built your technology to solve a problem that you believed was there. And you have to have that conviction all the way through and listen for, you know, ways in which you can make that more salient and viable for your customers. So for us, that big thing was we want to drive, help businesses drive revenue through the use of online video. And there's all these marketing automation technologies that have, you know, app stores um, that essentially align with that mission because marketing automation is all about driving revenue through through marketing projects. And so, we ended up integrating with a platform called Eloqua. You know, we we used basically all the money we had left to do that, and it was on the advisory of an EIR here at Communitech that was the head of product. We stuffed the three of us into my co-founder's car, covered it in Vidyard stickers, drove down to Orlando. Went to the show floor. It was a last ditch effort, and we closed like 50k in, in recurring business on that show floor, and it was from a, a million different pieces of advice that we came to that conclusion. But it was still around that that core mission that we put in place. Um, we've had investors who say, you know, you guys should have done, or sorry, at the time when social cam and, and video were big, why aren't you guys doing Instagram for video? My response was, well, that's, not what we, that's not what you invested in. That's not what we went out to do. We're not a consumer product. And Instagram is going to do Instagram for video, which it ended up doing, right? So I think you know, it's pretty clear when the, when the advice is bad, and you just have to be, be honest with yourself. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is generally, you should take advice from people who've done it themselves. Yeah. Because uh, uh, advice can sound good and not necessarily be good. Before we go over to Q&A, a couple of uh, uh, kind of last questions here. You talked a little bit about finding, you know, a very specific subgroup of customers, and in, the, in your first kind of first thousand users or so, two thousand users, how do you identify that subgroup? And was it obvious for your businesses that there was a subgroup um, early on, or is that something you discovered even further down down the line? I can I can roll right into that one. I, I would say, um, you know, PG always has a line: um, you can't change what you what you can't measure, and so uh, user analytics and user data. Um, if you're not able to actually talk to them to see what they're doing with the product, um, see how they're using it, is, in, is incredibly, incredibly valuable. So if you don't have those mechanisms in place, it's really hard to so, find. So the data's telling you, like, this cohort is the most engaged? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this cohort's super engaged. They're using the product. They're in there every day. You know, the holy grail for us was when um, companies started developing roles inside their business to manage their, manage their software, so director of video strategy. And we could see that start happening organically um, when someone had a session in the app that lasted an entire day. And so their workday is one screen in video and one screen in email. Wow. Um, yeah. And so that's the type of stuff that, that we looked for early. And those users got all the attention. And they're the ones that we asked for feedback and that we used to benchmark new ideas and roadmap against. Uh, Bannerman, how did you guys find your first kind of subgroup? How do you know which, which are there businesses that specifically, you know, 
your product really resonated with? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's quite challenging for us because um, what we've done now is we've made it so easy to book security, and so we see so many different use cases. Um, you know, literally everything from K-pop stars to certain celebs. Um, you have people that want to use it for their parking lot, um, people for their Sweet 16. Um, but for us, we, we've noticed that what was, what, what was best for us uh, was going after medium-sized offices to protect the employees, the, the computer equipment, make sure. What do you mean by best? When you say it was best for us, what do you, how do you define that it was best for you? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think what was best for the business. These were companies that um, were paying us on a reoccurring basis. Okay. Um, and so as a marketplace, it's, it's always great to find that reoccurring business. You know, it, it thrives on liquidity. Um, and so for us, we, we focus primarily on medium-sized offices and bars. But there are many different um, requests for security. And we, we try to fill them, but most of our outreach is focused on those two segments. OK, cool. Last question before we jump over to Q&A. It's kind of a catch-all, which is if you could tell something to yourself, you know, way on the first day of YC or at the early start of your company um, that you know now, what would it be? Uh, I've got a pretty clear memory in my mind where I was just worrying about something that didn't matter, and I think it was distracting me, and I couldn't, like, I couldn't do any downtime. I couldn't, you know, go watch a movie with my friends. I, I was stressed out. I was, I was, you know, distracted. Looking back, that was the most minor. I, I literally can't even remember what the problem was. <laughs> I just remember that I was dealing with it. And, you know, I've been at this for over seven years now, and there's always something burning down. There's always something that's going to just be the worst thing possible at the moment. And you have to get past that because it is a long, long battle. And if you get wrapped up and, and you get too emotionally invested in, in each individual problem, I mean, that's the hard part. You have to figure out which ones to get invested in. But you just can't get invested in every single problem. You have to know what to get past. And I didn't, I didn't know that at the time. It would have helped a lot. Yeah, I completely agree, Eric. Um, in one word, I think it's focus, right? Like, you need to know where to focus your efforts. Um, and that's a very hard problem. Like, you're, you're, you're starting a startup. There's a hundred different things you can do. You're getting advice from people to, like, literally pull your business in very different directions. But at the end of the day, you and your co-founders are leading this company. And you know it better than anyone else. You live, breathe, eat, sleep this company. Um, and just, you know, you need to know which feedback to listen to and which one's not So your to. advice to yourself is... Uh... It's would just be, focus. Yeah. yeah, like literally there was just too much noise in the early days. Um, and I think YC really helped us focus. And I want to just give plus one on like you run your own company. If you're a founder, um, anything anyone says to you, people that try to influence you, pull you in different directions, um, that can be really distracting and it can be uh, the wrong incentives. And, and just like he said, like you know it better than anybody else. Um, so you have to trust yourself. Um, I think that was, it sounds a little arrogant, but I think one of the things that kind of kept coming up for me was I should have just gone with my gut on that. Yeah. 100%. I was about to say the same thing for you guys stole my answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it turns out you actually know a lot of the answers, if not all the answers. And the best advisors or people you speak to about advice um, just kind of draw that out of you. So when, when I do have the, the opportunity to, to meet with Casser, He's not really telling me you have to do this, this, and this, and this. He's asking questions, you know? And that turns out, actually, that's a great framework for you when you talk to users, too. Yeah, I was, I was, I was thinking about this, and I, I don't actually have a, a clear example. So I was trying to imagine myself sitting in my bedroom worrying about something, and then, like, Mike from the future entering my bedroom. <laughs> look, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> I'd be sitting there in my underpants. You look so what? old. <laughs> so once I had, like, calmed myself down, I would probably say, hey, man, um, you know, rocket ships, don't have rearview mirrors. You're not even going to remember what you're dealing with right now. Uh, trust your gut. Focus on scale. Um, make sure that you know the relationships you have with the people you're building this business with are are secure and trusted, and you're all very well aligned and complementary. And you'll do great. Cool. <laughs> well, uh, thank you guys. A round of applause for you guys. Okay. Okay, great. Tiffany, come on on stage. Hello. Tiffany is uh, from uh, the last batch, right? Winter, winter fourteen, winter fifteen. Yes. Yes, Detroit uh, Water Project. Yes. Do you want to do a quick introduction? Sure. So I'm Tiffany Ashley Bell, the founder and executive director of the. Detroit Check one water two. Project. Oh, 
<laughs> Sorry about that. I'm actually a yeller. So I'm Tiffany Ashley Bell, the executive director and founder of the uh, Detroit Water Project, which helps people in Detroit and Baltimore with their water bills. Um, people there couldn't pay water bills just due to losing their jobs and medical issues, and the cities would turn them off, and we thought that was pretty shabby. So I started this last year in July, and we've paid over 230k in bills for like 900 families, uh, just through people all around the world just giving five bucks, 5,000 bucks or whatever. So that's quick spiel. So yes, uh, we just have. <laughs> Tiffany was going to be on the panel, and we just had some logistical issues, so that, that's that's why uh, we did that. So all right, uh, Q and A time. So just raise your hand. I'll repeat the question, and we'll go from there. In the green. Okay, uh, co-founders and early team members, uh, how do you know your co-founders are the right co-founder for you, and how do you know the early team members are the right team members for you? How do you go through that process of finding early people and finding your co-founders? Yeah, I can, I can maybe jump to that one quick. Um, so, uh, Devin Galloway is my, uh, my co-founder of Vidyard. There were three of us, there are now two of us. Um, and the reason being, there was an alignment amongst the three of us uh, early on. And, uh, you know, if I think about why I, I, I picked Devin, um, we were both engineers, we were both in the same class. We got along really, really well. So we started the company in fourth year uh, university, and we met in first year during Frosh Week during the scavenger hunt um, of a different name. And uh, we went and, and did this ice cream eating contest, and, uh, and they put a big bowl of ice cream in front of you and then um, told, told me that I had to feed the ice cream to him. Um, using my arms as his arms, and he turned around and he said, "Hey, man, like I've done this all the time." Um, <laughs> he's like, he's like, feed it to me as fast as you can. And so, so I, I where's threw, the story going? I, I was like, how do you, how do you pick your team? So, I, so I, uh, I was on a, red, I was pretty much on a red eye last night. So I'm a little, little. Anyway, so I, I, I threw the spoon and it like hit somebody else in the face, and then I, I grabbed the ice cream and just like. Fed it into his mouth, <laughs> and um, you know we've been kind of doing that ever since. With the, with the, with the and uh, um, and so I mean, when you when you're in a company, you, you move fast, you break things, and uh, you know you, you bend the rules a little bit, and you, you find ways of scaling quickly. And, and he and I were really well aligned on that. And he was also an engineer raised by accountants, and you know had great business acumen, and, and could fill the blanks because process and all that stuff aren't my strong suit. So. You know, in retrospect, it was great, but it was, again, built on a great friendship. And when I was in an internship in the Valley, he flew out um, to drive back with me. It's a 2,800 or 4,800 kilometer drive. And, um, and during that drive is when we came up with the idea for the business. And, uh, you know, we've done that drive since multiple times coming back from YC. And, and our relationship is just super strong. And, and it's absolutely essential that you nail that one. He's literally my best friend. And, and he, uh, he was the officiant at my wedding, that kind of thing. And, I think there's no, no better way to do it. So friends and classmates are good sources. What about early team members? How, how, how did you guys, guys find kind of good early team members other than just come to Waterloo and recruit? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, focus on that culture fit, 100%. Like this person has to be somebody that you're gonna stay up all night with, that you can drive 4,800 kilometers with. You know, it, it's, it, you know, the smarts, the resume, all of that is one half of it. The other half is your ability to just get along with them. Also, I think the more, the more passion that person has for what you're doing from like day one, it's, it's a really good indicator. Like uh, every time I've ever hired anybody who's come in with like already having thought about, about what we were doing and they had uh, like ideas and they were talking to me about things that were actually made sense in the context of the business. I mean, I, I would take that over somebody, especially in early days, over somebody who's really technically perfect for the role. Um, you don't want people in there early who are lukewarm on the concept of what you're building. You want people who are going to go to bat for you over and over again and who, at the end of the day, people who really get it. Yeah, I think one good analogy I've heard for early teams is um, whereas kind of large companies are kind of like a town of people working together, an early team is kind of like a basketball team or like a, a sports team. And it, the, the camaraderie that exists with, among that team is actually pretty important to get over some of these really, really big hurdles. Uh, next question. All the way in the back. That's you. Yep.
So uh, just to repeat the question. Um, so early on in the startup, you know, you're doing a lot of these things manually, almost to the point of kind of being consultancy. How do you make that transition over to something that is uh, viable and that grows rather than just continuing to get stuck in that early loop? I get really, are, they, are they paying you for the software or the consultancy? Okay. So. So they're paying both for the consultancy so and the software. So what you want to do is wrap all the money they're paying you guys to consult for the service into the product offering, so charge way more for the subscription revenue, because the multiple on that is way higher than the consulting revenue, and then hire people to manage that process. We call it customer success, and that's something that we've been doing since day one. I could speak more for the earlier days. Um, for a long time, it was just myself and my co-founder, um, and so he was tasked with the actual you know, building, and I was tasked with almost being like a PM. And so we would spend a lot of time together, and I would walk through, these are the, the, the really annoying parts of my day. This is taking up a lot of time. And we would come up with um, ways of you know, using software to disrupt that. We were essentially disrupting our time early on. And that enabled us to, to be able to do more in the day you know, because I didn't have to do these things that were manual. So we were good about, I almost acted like a Sherlock Holmes, and I'd investigate and say, hey, um, this is bugging me. This is taking up a lot of time. And then we would build something. And, we, and just the sum of all of those little things really added up. It's a great strategy if you, by splitting the team that way, where you have one person who's like you know writing code to alleviate the other person's manual tasks, will because the other person can tell you what is the thing that's the biggest bottleneck into actually onboarding even more and more early users or in, in Johnny's case businesses. Cool. Next question. Let's go up top. Look at that in the red. Uh, do you build first or do you sell first? Do you build first or do you sell first? Very generic, open-ended question. <laughs> we. We sold first. Uh, yeah, we, we had a, uh, yeah. OK, For Johnny a, says sell first. We couldn't sell first. <laughs> like, I'm going to make a machine that makes tea and uh, <laughs> 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 Show me something, and then I'll buy it. It's like, it makes tea, and yeah. it's a box. I'd love to have sold first. It didn't work. <laughs> we didn't even think of selling first. We were just building because we wanted it, and then selling kind of came later. Yeah, we, we validated based on selling, so we, we certainly sold first. I think our like entire business model is based on the concept of like selling it before you make it. So that's definitely how we did it. <laughs> we were solving an emergency sort of situation, so we just built first. So I think the point here, and the reason I, I kind of uh, you know uh, made a quip about that the question is, it's 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 so high level that it actually you almost lose some context there. And every company has a very different uh, path. Uh, I think the point, I, I guess the the overarching motto would be you know, make something users want. And that, that sometimes is just applied differently in different types of businesses, whether you're doing, you know, uh, uh, hardware to, to something like, uh, you know, helping people with their, with their water bills. In the plaid, right there, yep. How do you take care of yourself, both physically and mentally, in this kind of fairly grueling and exhausting process? I'll be honest, I actually go to therapy occasionally just to have someone who's objective and talk to me about things, who, um, who actually has some professional advice. But I also have friends who run companies that can just say, like, you shouldn't worry about this, you shouldn't worry about that. Then, like, regular folks that are just, like, not startup founders who can kind of keep me grounded and not, you know, people that don't want to talk about metrics and things all the time. Because, I mean, sometimes you just don't want to. So that's healthy to have just, like, friends and like professionals in different places that can help you with just different things when you're dealing with whatever. So one, one version of that is have outside, outside counsel, outside friends. Yep. Any, anything else you guys do to mentally and physically take care of yourselves? I think I'm doing a pretty shitty job of it right now, so I personally haven't figured it out yet. So that's a no. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pretty extreme, like, you know, especially in the early days of your startup, you want to, like, really be working a lot. Um, I think it's just important to have something that you do that you can relax yourself with or that's just separate from work. Um, it, it can be anything, you know. It's just, it, it can be exercise. I think the, the exercise is probably one of the best ones because you can, like, exercise for, like, 30 minutes and then it's, like, a pretty drastic break from like being on the computer, but um, yeah, man, it's tough. It's tough out there. Yeah, for me, maybe it was a, a really supportive girlfriend or significant other. Um, that helps a lot. I think, you know, at YC, we, the, when I was going through YCPG, used to say, you know, the, the, they only need to do four things, which is like eat, sleep, 
uh, talk to users and write code. And now we say, that, you know, the fifth one is exercise. It is absolutely a, an important aspect of building a company. Uh, one kind of thing that actually tip that really works with early companies is you exercise together as a team. If you just make like the co-founding team or the early team, like nine o'clock every day, you're gonna, you're gonna do, you know, you don't have to do jumping jacks together, but go to the gym together. Uh, and then you can kind of do both things of kind of do your stand up and get, get some, you know, get, get some physical exercise. And it is absolutely important, especially because it's a, it's a marathon. Other questions right there in the middle. There's a yeah. T-Bot competitor who's asking you, I'm kidding. I uh, he think the older demographic was not engaging with your product. Is that just because the results of, you know, it's like a techno technology lag? Yeah, there, there was a variety of factors. Um, one is their sensitivity to the price. We sell a cup of tea for $3. Um, some of these people have been making tea at home for a long time, so they don't want to pay that money. Um, the other one is they want pure tea. They just want Earl Grey. T-Bot is about customization and having fun with your food. And, the third was simply the technology piece. You know, you can order on your phone, you can order on the tablet. Um, I, I literally had someone, a user, must have been over 40, had never used a touch screen before. Like, didn't see that coming. You know, like, I don't want to ask him what phone he has in his pocket. <laughs> Probably a Blackberry. <laughs> in the back. I'll, I'll just take this. So, wh wh what do you do when the, the company doesn't have a software or technical component to it in terms of scale? This advice, and, and frankly, this panel and, and a lot of what YC does is really about really large, uh, ultimately scalable businesses. And I think that's why that advice is very counterintuitive that in the early days, actually, you're going to avoid that. Um, the fundamental difference between a small business and this term that's emerged called startups is the ability to grow consistently and fast. And, Frankly speaking, the easiest way and the reason Silicon Valley kind of exists is software. There's components of that in hardware and components of that in biotech. Uh, but like if you're starting a pizza chain, uh, like, a, like a local pizzeria, some of this advice is just not going to apply because it, it, it's just a very different type of business. So I wouldn't hold, this, is, this advice is actually for a very specific type of you know, company, which is a company that's trying to, to really make huge amount of impact and using technology as the lever for that impact. Um, in terms of international markets and domestic markets, I think uh, these, a lot of these things still apply. Um, I mean, technically, Canada is an international market if you're, say, if you're, if you're based in the States or, or vice versa, but even in the developing world, th these things about talking to your users, pairing them, treating them very, very well, and then using that feedback to inform the next steps is something you can definitely do anywhere in the world. It's not just, you know, Waterloo, uh, Mountain View specific. Right there? Startup life is difficult. How do you make it easier by doing one thing? Uh, one thing would be organizing your day correctly. Um, it, I think uh, like focusing on one thing at a time versus letting, uh, this isn't, I don't know if this is one thing, but it's like, it's making everything one thing instead of trying to think about 10 things. Cause obviously when you have a startup, you're gonna be thinking about a lot of stuff at once, but it, you have to structure your day so that you, you know, I'm gonna answer emails like during this period and I'm gonna code during this time and I'm gonna exercise for these 30 minutes and you don't have to be super strict about it but if you, do, if you let everything try to happen all at once, it just gets so hectic. Uh, yeah. Anyone else, one thing? Yeah, the, the big difference for me was uh, a lot of the time I spent was managing my calendar and, and trying to book meetings and coordinate with multiple people and uh, that's really time consuming and really, really difficult and so you know the big change on that question is we, uh, we had a growing office that had, had needs and we wanted to hire an office manager, but um, we also kind of had hired an office manager slash assistant that was shared across the founding team um, that could help us coordinate that stuff. And so my life is now completely managed by my calendar and every day I know exactly what I need to do and I just have to stay on point with that, um, have notes for meetings, all that type of stuff. And 
that means that I don't spend time scheduling, I spend time in those meetings providing value, adding context, and whatever the heck I'm supposed to do in those meetings. So I think that's a big, big shift, and there's a lot of ways you can do that without adding a person. Um, so I, I would just highly consider that. Okay, two more questions. In the back right there, you. When, what was the moment that you had to know you had to go all in? Uh, to twice when, I, when I was in fourth year and realized that I could either get a real job or keep doing what I was doing. Um, that, was a, that was a pretty good moment. Yeah, same. Uh, we were actually pushed by some investors. We, we, we were doing it part time. We went out and tried to raise some capital. And like an investor straight up asked us, like, you, you expect me to put money in this company and believe in you, and you don't even believe in it enough to quit your day job? In my case, it was grad school. So at that point, you know, it was a light bulb. I think with me, it was driven just by like need and the fact that like the city of Detroit kept turning people's water off regardless of what we did. So it was just like we kept getting more and more applications. So like I was a Code for America fellow originally um, and that fellowship ended like in November last year. But like during all that, we just got like over 1,200 applications in like a really, really short period of time. So it was like it was obvious that we have to keep doing this. Like people still need help. So it was just driven by like the problem and people's needs still being there. Cool, last question. This has to be really good because this is the last oh, one. So much pressure. So All right, who's enthusiastically waving there? There's, there's right some there. enthusiasm oh, yeah. up there. Yep. <laughs> uh, damn, I want to hear that question. How do you balance developing your personal skills versus developing the startup because sometimes they, you know, that might, that might be, there might be a conflict there. I think you have to find a way to make it work. Like, just kind of cheat. Like, if you want to be a more organized person, think about how that applies to your business, basically. Or if you want to be a morning person, think about the business value of doing that sort of thing. So just, like, tie it to what you want to do, like, personally. There's ways to make it work. It doesn't have to be, like, a... a was it a mutually exclusive sort of thing? I think there's a lot of ways to cheat by talking to your friends. Like the problems that you're going through are non-unique. Everyone's gone through them. Yours might be, like your set of problems might be slightly different, but someone has done it before. I find that a lot of the times when I'm thinking about investing a lot of time or effort into solving this problem, I go out for dinner with like two or three other people and they're like, oh yeah, this is the answer, just go and do this. And generally it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, I think that you'll find that um, if you don't take time for personal development, then actually that ends up hurting you more, more than setting aside time to do it. And that so often those things that you don't think are related to your business, but that you just for some reason want to pursue, end up uh, either directly helping you with your company or it just, it kind of like re-inspires you a little bit because um, it can definitely be a burnout situation, like we sit there coding in the same language all day, every day to just build the same product. Just doing something that's a little different um, can get you out of that funk and get you going in a way that overall is actually cr increases your productivity on your company too. I think early on, I think a point to be made is you are the business. When there's only two people, there isn't a lot, you know, the, what, where the business ends, where you end is actually, uh, you know, there isn't a real hard line. and so. So yeah, I don't think that's mutually exclusive. Okay, I think we're at the end of our time. Big round of applause for these guys. Well done. You guys, can, this is when you get up and you walk. Uh, out. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We have to get back to hacking. <laughs>